All right, guys. Well, again, um, I'm going to carry on with a few more thoughts on the nature of bigotry and nationalism. Check this out. Now, fair use applies if anybody from Fox is watching. All right. After the beheading, William Wallace's body was torn to pieces. His head was set on London Bridge. His arms and legs sent to the four corners of Britain as a warning. It did not have the effect that Longshanks planned. And I, Robert the Bruce, rode out to pay homage to the armies of the English king and accept his endorsement of my crown. I hope you've washed your ass this morning. It's about to be kissed by a king. Break with me! your man, Angus McFadgen, channeling his inner partisan. He's about to lead his bold heroes to victory across the Bannock Burn. That's from Braveheart. It's a fantastic movie it's set against the Scottish War of Independence. It's a tale of passion, of betrayal, of revenge, sacrifice, romance and victory in the face of impossible odds. If you haven't already seen it, please Go and watch it. It's a brilliant film. Um, it did for medieval and fantasy films. The same sort of thing that Star Wars did for science fiction. What I'm saying is, without Braveheart, there would have been there would have been no Lord of the Rings. There would have been no Game of Thrones. There probably wouldn't even have been any Vikings. Now, there's no fancy CGI effects and Mel Gibson surrounded himself with some of the finest actors from Ireland and the UK and if the extras look like real soldiers well it's kind of because they are the Irish army donated the FCA for the battle scenes and if you look closely enough you can see some of the lads using Hollywood as a great excuse for knocking the shite out of rival units the thing is though while you're watching it just remember that it's a work of fiction and it's one that shows a, a disturbingly anglophobic bigotry and it's a bit of a theme with Gibson, he carried it on into his next project The Patriot 
don't waste your time watching that if you haven't seen it already. It's one of those things that's got the British as the bad guys. Um, it's got British redcoats reenacting some of the worst atrocities of World War Two. You know the sort of thing, gunning down school children, rounding up villagers and burning them in their own churches, that sort of thing. Nice. Anyway, I want to talk about the reality. You know, what's the film based on? And why do modern Brits care about what happened more than 700 years ago? Now, I've done a couple of videos already um, on some of Scotland's origins. I've put the links below. But a brief history of Scotland, it runs something like this. In Roman times, the north of Britain was occupied by people that the Romans called the Picts and the north of Ireland was occupied by people that the Romans called Scots. Now over an extended period of time the Scots colonised the wee islands in between Ulster and the Scottish mainland. Now according to popular myth a Gallic re or king called Riata took the west coast of Scotland, Pictland, whatever you want to call it, by force of arms and he formed a huge kingdom called Dalriata, Riata share basically. Now according to the Venerable Bede, an English historian, the Scots, following Aidan Macabran, the king of Dalriata, were defeated by Ethelfrith of Bernicia at the battle of Degstaston. Now that happened in 603 AD. That made them clients first of the Northumbrians and then later of the Picts, possibly in Fort Hugh. Now bear in mind that Bede was... he considered the Dalriadans to be Irish and he was writing all of this 130 years after it happened. Irish sources... they record, a, they record the battle but they record it in a different way. They note that Ethelfrith's brothers, Theobald and Ianfrith, were killed. But either way, Aidan escaped and he handed the kingdom on to his son five years later. The, the Scots were the junior partners in the Scottish Pictish relationship after that. Now, around 840 AD, Chenaid Machalpin became the ruler of both Picts and the Scots and on that day according to a long academic tradition Scotland was born <laughs> except it's not quite that simple you see while modern English speaking historians are comfortable with having Kevin McAlpine as the first king of a united Scotland Kenneth wouldn't have had a clue what they were talking about. He ruled a country called Alapa, a very different place. Now, the linguistic fallacy of ascribing to an ancient nation the identity of a now extinct old nation is understandable. You know, history is complicated enough. There's, there's no need to make it even harder. But bear in mind that the entirely Celtic nation of Alapa isn't even close to the Scoto-Norman kingdom that existed three centuries later in the time of Bruce and Wallace. Britain had changed. The old Anglo-Saxon kingdoms from Bernicia to Wessex and the lands of the Britons from Rechet to Domnonia all the way down south they were all under Norman control, including the place that we now call Wales. Now Bede's habit of collectively referring to Germanic and Norse kingdoms as English, as if they were part of some mythical wider kingdom, had actually become a reality under the Normans. And the Normans' prediction about the Bretwalda, one man who could rule the whole kingdom, had come true as well. And the Normans had come to Scotland as well. Yeah, they'd they'd colonised the whole island. 
they did it mainly through marriage and the peaceful integration of powerful allies. Inheritance was often decided through maternal descent and that had brought many powerful Norman families um, into the aristocracy in Scotland as well as everywhere else. Now, mainland Britain used to be governed as three dozen or more different kingdoms, but by the time of Wallace and Bruce, it had become just two. Aleppo was in the north, and everything else was Angland. Now, Alexander III, he was crowned, <laughs> he was crowned Alexander Mac Alexander, the re or Alistair, son of Alistair, the king of Alaba. He married Margaret Plantagenet, the daughter of Henry III, the King of England, in 1251. They're pretty young. He was 10 years old. She was 11. Um, when they grew up, his reign was long and it was prosperous. And he saw Alapa transform from this war-torn, famine-stricken mess into a modern and highly successful trading nation. He managed to negotiate and maintain peace with England and Norway. He even managed to bring the Western Isles back under Scottish control. And he did it by treaty rather than by force of arms. Um, the next time somebody tells you that Scotland and England are natural enemies or that they've been at each other's throats for centuries, it's worth considering that in these dark ages, the Scots had a golden age under Alexander, and it was only possible with the support of our English friends and allies. Works out okay for the English as well. Now, when Alexander's last surviving heir died, the ancient kingdom was teetering on the edge of a civil war. Bear in mind the close links between the Scottish royal family and the English royal family, it seemed natural to look to the noble and fair English king to adjudicate the claims of the 13 different claimants to the throne. I mean, go ask a Norman for help. What could possibly go wrong? The problem was that Edward was neither noble or fair when it came to expanding his realm. He brutally conquered Wales and he'd fought long, hard, bitter campaigns in France. It shouldn't have been any surprise that his greatest efforts were going to be spent trying to bring the Scots to heel. I mean, eventually he gave himself the title Hammer of the Scots. Real nice guy. Out of the 13 different candidates, he decided that he was going to appoint, he was going to appoint John Balliol king. Now the thing is, he insisted that John's, author John's authority stemmed from his own. Now he forced all sorts of things on poor John. He made him adopt an English chancellor. He changed the wording on the Royal Seal of Scotland. He took on and he resolved disputes that people had with the Scottish King. He just generally went out of his way to humiliate John and publicly demonstrate to the whole Christian world that he now held suzerainty over the Scots. Now in 1294, Edward demanded that John should come and fight for him in France. He even gave him a list of forces that he had to assemble and ordered him, he ordered a king to report to him in Portsmouth at the opposite end of the British Isles. Now, don't get me wrong, the Scots and the English had fought side by side lots of times before, but they'd asked for aid, they'd asked each other for aid, and the aid had been freely given. There'd never been any orders. Nobody had ever tried to tell the other, like a ruler to a vassal, that they had to jump. John couldn't do it. He refused the order and instead he actually formed an alliance with the French. <laughs> that worked out well. I mean the result, was, the result was predictable enough. A veteran English force rode north 
and they handed John his oars. They fought a battle at Dunbar in 1296. In June of that year, Tum Tabard ended up petitioning Edward for mercy, begging for his life basically. He was stripped of his royal seal, he was stripped of his clothes. Clothes were bearing his royal coat of arms. And he was, according to the scribes, according to the, the Senachis and the, uh, the historians of the time, he was thrown to the ground. Now that may or may not be a euphemism for something else entirely. Who knows? Anyway, the pantomime was over and the unfortunate ex-monarch was sent into exile in France where he spent the rest of his life under house arrest at the Chateau de Helicourt. Now, in August of that year, about 1600 Scots, that's pretty much every noble and burgess in the entire country, were forced to sign a document that came to be known as a Ragman's Roll. It was basically a personal declaration of loyalty to Edward. So, we all became good little English persons. The end. <coughs> okay, nah, not quite. In the south of Scotland, a minor noble by the name of William Wallace avenged the murder of Marion Braidfoot. Uh, he led some men against the Sheriff of Lanark, a fellow called William de Hesselrig. And once he'd killed the Sheriff, he dismembered the body. Now, popular tradition holds that she was Wallace's wife or mistress and that she'd previously helped him escape the Sheriff's court. Not sure how true that is. What is true is that Wallace continued his attacks on the English in the south of Scotland and he, carried, he gathered a large body of fighters around him. In the northwest, one of the Scottish knights who had been defeated at Dunbar finally made his way back home. He raised a small force, but he set about taking this small force and liberating his own lands. Now while Wallace has become a national hero, he's famous the world over, <sighs> Andrew de Moray was much more obscure. And it's a shame because his achievements were even more impressive. In a short, sharp campaign he took all the castles and defences in northern Scotland. He destroyed an entire English fleet at Aberdeen. He negotiated a peaceful resolution with the Scots army that Edward sent up north to subdue him. And after all that, he arranged a fast march down to the south, where he met Wallace. Now the two combined forces, and then, you've seen the film, they set about the English army in Scotland at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Afterwards, after they'd beaten the English army, Wallace was made guardian of Scotland. Um, Moray, he was fatally wounded in the fight. Most accounts have him living for a few months longer, but chances are he died that winter. Now the following year at Falkirk, Wallace was defeated uh, by a large English army. Didn't help things though. The rebellion just grew stronger. John Common and Robert de Bruce were mortal enemies and they were rivals for the throne, but they combined forces and they were named as joint guardians of Scotland, the same way Wallace and uh, Wallace and de Morney had been. De Bruce made peace with the English in 1302. It looked or it seemed that Balliol was going to return to Scotland. There's no need for him to fight on. Um, Common, on the other hand, he kept fighting. Now the Lord of Badenoch was a competent commander. He virtually annihilated an English force at the Battle of Roslyn in 1303. Now, he finally made peace with the English in 1304 after gaining assurances from Edward that Scotland's laws and Scotland's customs would be restored to the ones that had been held under Alexander III. But there was a price. The King wanted Wallace. Wallace was to be hunted down, arrested and handed over to the English. And he duly was. 
a Scottish knight by the name of John de Monteith captured Wallace and it didn't go well. He was hideously tortured. They dragged him naked through the streets of London. They hung him until he lost consciousness. They revived him and then they forced him to watch as they removed his genitals, then his intestines and finally start hacking out his vital organs one by one and they threw all of it into a vast brazier a huge stone fire next to the torture table his terribly mutilated corpse was beheaded and it was hacked into four parts his head was put in a spike in London for the people to laugh at what was left of him was sent on a tour of Britain yeah, great entertainment for the people in Edward's realm that had been unfortunate enough to miss the execution. The clergy back in Scotland had decided to follow a bit of a Latin, ancient Latin advice. Audentis Deus is be juvat. De Bruce was the best candidate for the Scottish throne so they offered him their unqualified support. He was a rash young man. He repaid them by murdering John Common right before the altar at Greyfriars Kirk in Dumfries. Nasty. Now that, that desecration should have got him excommunicated. Eventually the Pope did. But Robert Wishart the Bishop of Glasgow, he absolved de Bruce and less than seven weeks later he gathered all the major clergy figures in Scotland and had him had him crowned King Robert the first King of Scotland. <coughs> you know the Scots were so chuffed at having a new king they actually crowned him a second time. Isabella Macduff, the Countess of Buchan, demanded the right to crown King Robert on behalf of the Earl of Fife, who was a captive of the English and not yet old enough to do that sort of thing himself anyway. So Robert and the clergy, they bowed to her wish, the wish of the nobles of Scotland, and he was duly crowned a second time on the 26th of March in 1306. I said he was a brash young man. De Bruce was about to learn a really harsh lesson. He surrounded an English army, excuse me, led by Emiah de Valence at Perth, and then he offered to meet them in battle. Now it's a chivalrous offer. It's common enough in feudal warfare. And de Valence refused, and then de Bruce retired to Methven, a town a few miles away, to spend the night. During the night, de Valence's force fell on them, ambushed them and virtually wiped them out. You don't turn your back in a Norman and you don't ever take them at the word. King Edward himself, he was leading an army invading from the south. He captured de Bruce's queen Elizabeth, captured his daughter Marjorie, captured his sisters Christina and Mary, he even captured Isabella Macduff. The ladies were harshly treated. Mary and Isabella were actually hung in outdoor cages off the side of castles for about four years in all weathers. It went even worse for their bodyguards. Robert's brother Neil was in charge and he was hideously executed exactly the same way Wallace was. De Bruce was utterly defeated. He just disappeared from Scotland. Nobody's really sure where he went to, where he fled. Some say Ireland, some say the Hebrides. He might have gone north, out to the Orkneys or the Shetlands. He might even have gone to Norway. But he came back. The following year he came back and he was a very different man. Ah, uh, de Valence was sent after him. And de Valence was utterly defeated at a place called Loudon Hill, not far from where I stay today. Um, it wasn't glorious cavalry charges, it wasn't chivalric warfare. The Bruce dug fortifications and he forced the English 
to face him head on on terms that the Bruce dictated. It's a very similar battle to the Battle of Stirling Bridge. King Edward actually died of natural causes and when he did the Bruce ignored the English. He turned his attention inward, tried to secure his position in Scotland and for two years he made war on the Commons and he made war on the MacDougalls. He utterly destroyed the Scots that were standing against him. And then and only then did he turn round and give his full attention to the English forces that were still in Scotland. Over the next three years he captured and he destroyed every English possession in his realm. But he refused to be drawn into battle by the armies that the English sent north. The way he did it, he laid waste to the land before them. He was basically bleeding the English treasury white. They had to spend vast sums supporting the invading armies. And when the armies reached Scotland, they didn't even glimpse their enemy. Because while they were scouring an empty landscape, starving half to death, he was ravaging the north of England. He was dragging them back to defend Cumbria and Northumbria. And as soon as they got back into England, he just disappeared, faded like the mist. The Bruce had become one of the greatest guerrilla leaders in history. Eventually, the only castle in Scotland that the English still held was at Stirling, where it all started. The Bruce, ult well, say that again. the Bruce issued an ultimatum, and Edward II marched north one last time. Now, Edward didn't expect a fight, but just in case there was one, he made sure they had plenty of muscle on hand. His force included two thousand mounted knights, roughly 10,000 foot soldiers from northern England, another 2,000 spearmen from Wales. There was a further force, force of Irish, nobody's got a share of the numbers. There were 200 English crossbowmen, there were a thousand Welsh archers, and there were an unknown number of archers from the north of England. Now the Bruce's forces, wow, well, they hardly compared. The Bruce had 500 light horse, about 4,500 pikemen. He had a few hundred archers. But the Bruce had Scotland. The terrain belonged to Bruce. And he knew exactly how to use it. As Edward approached Stirling, he came north along the old Roman road. There were makeshift horse traps, pots they called them at the time, that had been cut into the turf on either side of it. Edward was looking at it as a clear attempt to keep the English off of the moor. And then the Scots allowed themselves to be seen north of the Bannockburn, a wee river that ran through the area. And it looked like they were trying to tempt the English into an advance, perhaps a deliberate lure. Edward wasn't fooled though. He knew that the Bruce was going to run away, same as he always did. He sent two small scouting forces north. He was no idiot. And he spread his, his army out behind them, out onto the moor, got well away from the road. And then he prepared to advance on the, Scottish, on the smaller Scottish army. That wasn't quite as easy as it might sound. He had a lot of troops to organise. He had some very difficult terrain to cover. While it was happening, the Earl of Hereford led 300 heavy horse towards a place called Coxtet Hill. And they're amazed to see, right out there in the open, there's Robert the Bruce, sitting on a small pony, wearing light armour and carrying nothing but an axe. An English knight, a chap by the name of Henry de Boone, he spurred forward, shouting a challenge for the king to come and face him in a duel. You don't get an opportunity like that. <laughs> Ever. It should have been an incredibly one-sided fight. The Englishman was galloping in full armour. He was on top of a mighty destroyer, a huge war horse. He was armed with lance, shield, a full array of close, close quarter weapons. And the Scot, 
well he was on a wee palfrey and to all intents and purposes he looked transfixed as if he'd been caught in alarm just staring down like a rabbit at his approaching doom the duel was pretty much the battle in miniature the knight hurtled in he saw an easy victim and he saw glory waiting for him how many knights get to kill a king and the Bruce just waited patiently right at the last moment he spurred his mount he stood right up in the stirrups and the Bruce was a big man six foot one was a giant back in medieval times he stood right up in his right up in his stirrups and he smacked the knight right in the back of the head with his axe with enough force that he actually broke the axe Hereford's force were absolutely appalled that boy had just gone down with one hit more than that though they suddenly realised that they were far too close to the Scottish pikemen that were charging in behind their king the heavy cavalry couldn't move they couldn't charge there were too many of them to turn around they were forced back by a wall of spears and lahabar axes didn't go well for them now to the east Sir Robert Clifford's force had met a very similar fate under the pole arms of Thomas Randolph the Earl of Moray's force same gig they saw what looked like an easy mark they charged up to it and all of a sudden out of the trees and the bog around them they're surrounded by pikes and lock arbors you'd think Edward would take the hand but he didn't. Instead of withdrawing, he kept on preparing his army for an advance across a broad front. It took forever. They were manoeuvring all night. By morning, they were just about in the kind of order Edward wanted them to be in. He didn't expect to see anybody, but he was absolutely astonished to see the Scots lined out in front of him. Tradition says that his reaction was, my God, will they actually fight? It had taken most of the night to get his army into position. His boys were tired, they were demoralised, and they were far less convinced that they could win than he was. Edward saw the Scots kneel down before him and burst out laughing. He thought they were begging him for forgiveness. Now his troops weren't laughing. They recognised pious men making their peace with God, ready to die for their cause. The English heavy, the English heavy cavalry charged straight away, but in the soft, the mud of the peat, they couldn't get enough traction to build any kind of momentum. Now the Scots were advancing in three shelterns, vast formations of pikemen, and like a phalanx, but on steroids. They met the heavy horse with their pole arms before the cavalry lances could get near them. The charge faltered, it stopped in its tracks, and then slowly, inexorably, the English force was pushed back. They were pushed back into the advancing footmen that were following in behind. Now the English had archers but they couldn't shoot for fear of hitting their own men. But those men were getting pushed back further down the slope, back in into the boggy depression that's cut by the burn. Uh, the unease that they were feeling started to become fear. And in some of them fear became panic. The English line began to accelerate going backwards. So James Keith and James Douglas led the Scottish light horse around the English flanks and then they hurtled in to cut down the English archers before they could get their, get their weapons into play. The Scots ponies could gallop at full pelt across moorland that would bog down the heavier coursers and the destriers that the English knights favoured. And just as the battle was beginning to turn just as it was beginning to look lost. The Bruce called on the small folk 
he had untrained auxiliaries, he had his baggage train. They weren't doing anything. So he had them form up, make themselves look like troops, and had them run down the run down the hill from Coxtet Hill towards the battlefront. It was far too much. The English thought a second army would join in the field, and they just broke. They fled the field if they could. Edward himself had to be rescued and led to safety by his knights. The Scottish troops almost got him. Most of his army weren't so lucky. It was an absolute slaughter behind him. Now Bannockburn wasn't the end of the Scots' struggle for independence. It would be 14 years, 14 years bitter warfare before the English finally recognised the Scots' right to self-determination. They signed a treaty uh, called Edinburgh Northampton. But those years, those 14 years of warfare, were fought on English and Irish soil. Edward had been sent home, never to come back. So how does Braveheart compare to history? Well, mostly it doesn't. Randall Wallace, when he was writing his script, he cherry-picked a few events from his namesake's legend and he just wove them into Hollywood adventure. He makes a point that some things are worth fighting for, even dying for. But the problem is that the film uses a modern demographic, the English, as the enemy, dramatising historical slights and adding them with all sorts of horseshit. Um, just Premium Noctis, that maiden's having to sleep with the Lord on the wedding night. Fuck me. The film doesn't acknowledge the sacrifices made by numerous Scottish patriots. The people who died in the struggle, there's too many to list, but men like Andrew de Morey, John Common, all of the Bruce's brothers, the film sells itself as Scottish, but it was actually filmed in Ireland, mainly in Ireland, with a host of Irish acts, actors and extras. And the film's peddling that same old Irish victim narrative that Hollywood seems to love so much. They've been ramming it down a gullet for over a century. Only this time, it's the Scots as a sort of substitute Irish people. And it didn't show Scotland. I think there's one scene where you've got... You got for reasons, for reasons unknown, you've got Mel Gibson running across Scottish hills all by himself. The thing is, the Scots and the Picts before them, they won victory after victory against impossible odds because the land around here, it lends itself to defence. It's nothing new. There's compelling evidence to believe that the wall that Hadrian built was a response to the appalling losses that his forces in northern England and southern Scotland were facing. There was an elite legion, the Ninth. They may have been entirely wiped out in the conflict. Now Hadrian was certainly, he was reinforcing England for a reason. He built that wall for something. Now, having Mel and his plucky Irish heroes charging around a well-mown lawn in all of the battle scenes. It was, it just, it jarred on me. It was one of the worst parts of the film for me. But you know, the last word goes to some wag that Gibson talked to on the film's release in Scotland. He walked up to the fella and he says to him, what do you think of the film? The laddie looks at him and says, well, Battle of Stirling Bridge could have done with a bridge. Yeah, Gibson's like, well, it kind of got in the way. Aye, that's what the English seem to. <laughs> Layers, guys.